Good evening to one and all who are joining us today for this panel discussion, Recent Approaches for Diagnosis, Treatment and Management of Leukemia. It gives me immense honor and pleasure to introduce our moderator and panelist for today. The session would be uh, moderated by Dr. Abhishek Dudatra, who is Director of Hematology and Bone Marrow Transplant at HCG Ahmedabad. The panelists for today are Dr. Aditya Murali, who, are, who is Senior Consultant, Medical Oncology and Hemato-Oncology at Apollo Hospitals, Bangalore. Dr. Sunish, who is Assistant Professor, Medical and Hemato-Oncology at Department of Internal Medicine at MOSCMM Medical College, Kerala. And Dr. Unni Krishnan B, who is Consultant, Department of Medical Oncology and Hematology at Amla Institute of Medical Sciences, Kerala. The structure for today's session is, once the introduction is done, uh, we'll have a panel discussion towards recent approaches for diagnosis, treatment, and management of leukemia, which will be, which will be moderated by Dr. Abhishek and panelists Dr. Aditya, Dr. Umi Krishnan, and Dr. Sanish. Post that, we'll have a live question and answer session from the audience, and a vote of thanks will be delivered. General instructions for today's session are, all the participants will be muted during the webinar, if you have any queries, please type in the Q&A section. If you have any comments, please type in the chat section. Queries and questions will be addressed at the end of the webinar by the moderator. This session will be recorded and the recordings will be shared via email notifications once the recorder is set available. Polls will be raised at the start as well as at the end of the session for all the participants. We request all the participants to kindly provide with the valuable feedback and answering the whole questions. Our panelist for today is Dr. Aditya Murali, who is Senior Consultant, Medical and Hematoonchology at Apollo Hospital, Swangler. Dr. Murali has a vast experience in treatment of lung cancer, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, lymphomas, as well as leukemia. He has almost 500 plus cases to his credit. He is trained in bone marrow transplantation from Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer, New, uh, Cancer from New York. Dr. Aditya has more than 10 publications in national as well as international journals to his credit and has a key area of interest towards acute myeloid leukemia, multiple myeloma, lung cancer, and bone marrow transplantation. The next panelist is Dr. Oni Krishnanji who is Consultant, Department of Medical Oncology and Hematology, Kamla Institute of Medical Sciences, Kerala. He has a core area of interest towards hematolymphoid malignancies in adults and AYA, solid malignancies in adult and AYA, and has many publications to his credit in peer-reviewed journals. Dr. Sunish is Assistant Professor, Medical and Hematoonchology, Department of Internal Medicine, at MOSC M Medical College and Hospital in Kerala. He is a member of Indian Medical Association, All Kerala Medical and Pediatric Oncology Association, International Academy of Clinical Hematology, Royal College of London, and Hemato Hematology Cancer Constrogen. He has done various presentations and activities like academic presentations in AMPOK annual meetings and a, and a speaker for CIG Academy and also done various presentation in clinical club meet in MOSC MM hospital and actively participates in various conferences. He has a clinical profile of patients with snake bites coming to, with a, to a tertiary gear center and response assessment in the LPCL and to RCHOP regimen with respect to IHC profile. The moderator for today is Dr. Abhishek Dudatta who is Director of Hematology and Bone Marrow Transplant at HCG Cancer Center, Ahmedabad. He has his expertise and primary areas of interest in hematology and hemato-oncology, and he has special interest in bone marrow transplantation. He has completed his fellowship in hematopoietic stem, stem cell transplantation from prestigious National University Hospital, Singapore, and is recognized gold medal for DNB hematological examination held in the year 2014-15, and also served as a reviewer in prestigious journal of bone marrow transplantation. He has presented various posters and papers in different conferences. With this, I'll stop sharing my screen and hand over the platform to Dr. Abhishek to kindly go further with the panel discussion. Thank you, Dr. Shubhi. 
for the introduction and also thank you for organizing this panel discussion i thank uh, to all panelists as well for providing their valuable time today <clears throat> so as we know that we are going to discuss today recent approaches for diagnosis treatment and management of leukemias so leukemia itself is a very vast topic so today's discussion will be restricted to acute leukemias only and uh, as we know that medical science is very rapidly evolving so for leukemias as well for last uh, i think for two decades we have seen very significant advancement in diagnostics new drug developments and supportive care as well and uh, reliance on conventional chemotherapeutic agents which are very toxic has reduced and overall this has translated into significantly improved patient outcome so uh, we'll be having a few a uh, few questions will be directed to each panelist but after uh, answer is over anyone can uh, add add uh, their points or give comments so uh, we'll start few questions so uh, i think we'll start with dr aditya murli so dr aditya how common is uh, acute leukemia globally and do we have any uh, precise data on incidence of leukemias in india uh dr abhishek fantastic question and thanks for having me on board so uh, as per the global kind data leukemias do come in the figure in the top 10 uh, cancers in india however when we talk about uh, precise uh, numbers the issue here is that the data collection for acute leukemia is, is a little bit difficult especially because there is a significant bias in terms of where the patients present to leukemia acute leukemias are uh, seen as the age increases the incidence will also go up especially of amls whereas in alls the the incidence is probably higher in the adolescent or the young age group given such a uh, different uh, uh, age distribution the presentation is almost always at a government facility wherein the data collection is a little difficult so in terms of precise numbers of the actual incidence it's tough to say but it is a part of the top 10 cancers in india yes very true dr aditya so there is a great difficulty in knowing the exact incidence and it is very much dependent on age groups and it's quite heterogeneous so uh, next question is to dr unni krishnan so dr unni krishnan how do these patients uh, present yes, to us and what are the you know typical clinical signs and symptoms and do you think there are any sign on sign or symptom which is specific to leukemia or yeah. its subtype all or ml uh yeah uh, sir uh, so first of all good evening and uh, thank you for the opportunity uh, and uh, sir i will uh, so uh, coming to the leukemia the uh, presentation uh, the aml and the ml some common features are there the patient may present with features of myelosuppression like uh, features of uh, recurrent uh, anemia or uh, thrombocytopenia anemia may be a dyspnea or a tired or something like that and for bleeding manifestations with recurrent Uh, bleeding from gum bleeding etc etc and uh, for uh, issue due to the uh, lymph due to the wbc dysfunction patient may present with a high grade <laughs> fever and uh, with uh, some unusual infections and all and these are the usual presenting complaints and sometimes the patient may present with some uh, unusual presentations like just checking the counts and found to have uh, high counts and uh, maybe doing a smear count to leukemia like that there is another small presentation and uh, some uh, case of uh, leukemia like apml may present with uh, severe bleeding manifestations and dic may be the first presentation and uh, uh, so and uh, uh, the clinical presentation the between all and aml uh, one is the age age as already discussed age may be the main thing may be younger age group more prone for all while older people are more for aml and some features may point towards an all like lymphadenopathy then hepatosplenomegaly especially in younger age group you will may more thinking of some all while uh, aml there is organomegaly and lymphadenopathy is rare some gamma hypertrophy seen monocyte leukemia like that so that is a usual presentation um that's all okay yes so thank you dr unikrishan so it, it is very unfortunate that there are no uh, you know specific sign or symptom Uh, which can be associated with leukemia so unless you do the cbc you might miss out on the cases and uh, so specifically what do you expect on uh, cbc and smear and what are the common lab abnormalities which we see in the basic laboratory test dr sunish uh, good evening sir actually 
So, if a patient coming with the features of bone marrow failure and uh, hepatosplenum or lymphadenopathy and you suspect leukemia, and uh, the first test you should be ordering will be, you should be very eager to know his uh, uh, complete blood counts. Like, uh, what is the uh, anemia, what is the platelet count, what is the total cell count, uh, and what are the differentials. So, <clears throat> from the CBC itself, there will be uh, a significant neutropenia will be there. And uh, sometimes there will be a pancytopenia or sometimes there will be very elevated uh, WBC counts. So, <clears throat> most of the patients will have a feature of bone marrow failure in the form of anemia and uh, thrombocytopenia. So, coming to the other biochemical panels, uh, the LFT, uh, there will be uh, some alterations if there is significant liver involvement, like uh, there will be elevated uh, STPT or STOT. STOT will be more uh, if there is significant hemolysis also. And uh, the uh, albumin globulin reversal, there may be uh, seen in uh, a, like, uh, some number of cases. And uh, bilirubin will be significantly high if there is uh, uh, hepatic involvement. And uh, most of the patients will have a um, renal failure. And uh, the, the most important thing that we are more interested in looking into will be the uh, electrolytes like uh, potassium, calcium, phosphorus. Because uh, some, uh, some of the patients up, uh, may present in a tumor lysis syndrome. So it is very important to diagnose that condition uh, as early as possible and manage it. Uh, along with the management of leukemia. And uh, definitely the diagnosis of leukemia will come from a peripheral smear. Uh, the, the, not the final diagnosis, the, the clue for a leukemia will come from the per, uh, peripheral smear. And uh, the type of blast, uh, the pathologist will be uh, sometimes very confident in identifying a, uh, uh, the Fagot cell in an APML. And uh, sometimes they can differentiate between lymphoblast and a myeloblast. And uh, with the help of uh, other basic stains like uh, MPO and PAS, they can differentiate between lymphoblast and myeloblast most of the time. And uh, after that, uh, we will, uh, once you have a strong suspicion, we will, uh, if there is adequate blast counts in the peripheral blood, we either we go for a uh, flow cytometry in the peripheral blood, or if the patient is having a pancytopenia and there is no significant blast in the peripheral blood, we will go for a bone marrow with the, all the panel of investigations, including a pro-cytometry, cytogenetic analysis, karyotyping, all these things. And uh, with uh, with the help of all these, we can uh, come to uh, diagnose, uh, diagnose of the uh, acute leukemia. And uh, the, the role of imaging in an acute leukemia comes uh, if there is a T-cell leukemia with a mediastinal mass uh, that can be picked up in the uh, X-ray or CT and hepatosplenia megali and um, abdomen lymph nodes, all this can be uh, picked up from an EUST abdomen. So these are, uh, and uh, other uh, blood investigations like uh, coagulation abnormalities. Uh, the APML uh, typically present with uh, coagulation abnormalities. So um, these are the common investigations that will give some clue regarding the uh, diagnosis of uh, acute uh, leukemia. Okay. So thank you, Dr. Sunisha. I think you have covered a common and important question we get from medical students and residents. That, yeah. Sorry. Hello. Oh, sorry, sir. We just lost yeah. you for a few seconds. Okay. Is it okay now? Yes, sir. It's fine now. Yeah. So, uh, Dr. Sunisha, uh, there is one very common and important question we get from medical students and residents that if leukemia is, you know, proliferation of Particularly leukopenia. So, would you like to explain that? Or um, uh, sorry, sorry, I couldn't get your question because of yeah. So, so leukemia is proliferation of white blood cells, right? Leukemic blast. Yes. So, how yes. come these patients have leukopenia? So, this is very co common and basic question, but very very important, right? So, this question we get from usually residents and medical students. So, if you can explain it to them, maybe or yeah. any other panelist. Yeah, well, uh, that's a very uh, good question. Actually, uh, leukopenia because of the uh, the, uh, the in leukemia, what happens is the immature blast will be uh, will be proliferating immensely in the marrow. So it will replace the normal hematopoietic cells uh, very much, and uh, it will not allow uh, the normal hematopoietic cells to become mature 
and so the 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 adequate uh, growth uh, time and uh, growth uh, potential of that hematopoietic cell will be very less and uh, there will be associated uh, hemo uh, the uh, lysis of the hair there will be hemophagocytosis or embryo polysis that will even uh, kill the uh, the uh, even stem cells also and uh, there may be sometimes uh, due to the huge hepatosplenomegaly and uh, peripheral lysis also there may be a chance of uh this uh, counts uh, may be getting low so this may be the uh, reason for getting a uh, pancytopenia in a uh, case of uh, acute leukemia true so perfect so most of the time this blast they start proliferating inside the marrow it's not necessary that they will come out because of lots of adjacent factors and usually they replace the normal hematopoiesis so thank you dr sunish for this explanation uh so now uh, you know most of the time this patient they do not come to hematological oncologist directly most of the time they are treated outside for two to yes and they, they have received some treatment like blood transfusion vitamins antibiotics and some of them they also received steroids before presenting to cancer hospital so uh, this question is again to dr sunish that why should steroids be avoided in suspected case of leukemia Uh, so this is i think the most important question for a uh, yeah. general uh, practitioner because uh, most of the time when we get uh, a case like this um, some of the patient at least some of the patients will get some uh, courses of steroids so this will uh, entirely alter the picture of the uh, uh, patient because uh, this lymphoblast they are extremely sensitive to steroids so the lymphoblast will uh, it, it can be uh, there will be a a uh, transient uh, 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 transient uh, uh, reduction in the number of blasts in the peripheral blood cell after you are you are given a steroid so there may be a diagnostic difficulty for the pathologist even if you give a good marrow sample to the uh, pathologist there may be significant necrosis to uh, to the marrow or the blast cell counts will be very low or uh, they, uh, they cannot uh, find out adequate uh, blast and their morphology to uh, get the proper diagnosis so this is a, a very um, a difficult situation for a clinician to get a diagnosis and the patient is uh, very sick and you are not getting the proper diagnosis so there will be a delay in getting the proper diagnosis uh, one, one, one if you are given a um, Uh, given uh, uh, steroids before uh, you have in phenotype the proper cell yes so very important point steroids must be avoided in uh, suspected case of leukemia uh, so uh, dr aditya now we have a patient with uh, you know uh, typical sign symptoms of fever and bleeding and patient has some abnormal circulating uh, blast so how do you confirm the diagnosis of acute leukemia and is bone marrow examination required in all patients a uh, excellent question dr abhishek so whenever we suspect an acute leukemia and as you said almost always the biggest clue is in the peripheral smear for the patient so uh, if uh, there is any abnormality found on the basic cbc the first investigation to be done is a peripheral smear if a peripheral smear is indicative of acute leukemia that's when we need to do further confirmative uh, investigations let me talk about the confirmative investigation so although as one of my other um, expert colleagues said things like you know the fagot cells or the apml you can sometimes uh, pick up even on a peripheral smear as a rule almost all acute leukemias we will want to do a bone marrow study there is absolutely no two ways about it and the reason to do a bone marrow study is twofold the first thing is to do a immunophenotyping and exactly type what what acute leukemia is it whether it is a lymphoblastic leukemia or whether it's a myeloid leukemia so that's the first big reason the second big reason here is that we need to do cytogenetic analysis and uh, molecular analysis in today's day and age as you said in your introduction the outcomes have significantly improved and the way we evaluate i mean when when i was training the way i evaluated a leukemia and now there there is significant difference there are especially when we talk about disease like aml wherein there are so many molecular targets it is incumbent that we are able to get a good amount of marrow material and try and make sure that we do the chromosomal karyotyping as well as the molecular studies to to 
not just determine the prognostication, but also to risk stratify and uh, they give uh, strat uh, risk stratified treatment. The the uh, other uh, supportive investigation, obviously, in uh, the scenario is looking at the renal function test to especially look at uh, uh, whether there is any tumor lysis syndrome, whether there is any electrolyte abnormalities. Uh, apart from this, in acute lymphoid leukemia, uh, a CSF study needs to be done. By and large, whenever there are circulating blasts, the current uh, thinking is that in the presence of a circulating blast, we do not put a needle, we do not do a lumbar puncture at presentation. Only when we have a blast elimination, at least a day blast clearance, that's when we try and do a, at least that's what I do it in my practice. Uh, so bone marrow, cytogenetic studies, molecular studies, CSF plus or minus, along with the routine blood investigations. And uh, in terms of imaging, as one of my colleagues said, if it's a TALL, then maybe look at a chest X-ray or a CT just to look whether there is any media cell widening. Yeah, excellent answer, Dr. Aditya. So, uh, of course, basic tests like microscopy and spatial stains help us in reaching the diagnosis, but no one can label air alone AML without doing immunophenotyping in uh, present time. So, uh, do you avoid in any cases, you know, doing bone marrow, if your play patients count, uh, say, more than 1.5 lakhs in patients, is, is there any, uh, uh, you know, particular case scenario where you can avoid bone marrow examination? Uh, you're talking about an acute leukemia, is it? Yes, 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 yes. Acute leukemia, I don't, I don't see any reason unless... I, I I would not have come across a situation in the last few years of my practice wherein I have avoided doing a marrow. Right, right, right. So just to add on a point that if there is an elderly patient with, you know, clear-cut uh, circulating blast, which is high in number and you can clearly run immunophenotyping and your intention is not curative, maybe in few cases we can avoid marrow and still do the diagnosis. That was just the point. Correct. But but I yeah. think even here, Dr. Abhishek, especially elderly patients, when we are looking at AML as a more likely diagnosis, in an yeah, AML, yeah. Um, picking up uh, IDH1 mutation, picking up all the molecular yeah, subtypes, yeah. Yeah, more yeah. often than not, a marrow material is probably better than a peripheral blood material. But true, I take your true. point. That's fine. If, if yeah. it's a non-curative intent, 85, yeah. 90 year old chap, why not? Why, why, yeah. why, why honestly do a marrow? Fair enough. Because this is a test where most of the patients are apprehensive after you know reading and watching YouTube videos regarding the about the procedure. So very very few uh, patients where we can avoid and still make the diagnosis. Okay, okay. So we uh, move on to Dr. Unni Krishnan. So Dr. Aditya uh, 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 gave us an overview on how to how we confirm the diagnosis. But once we have the confirmed diagnosis of AML or ALL, would you like to still do some special test? And why, uh, Dr. Unikrishan, please? Yeah. yeah, I will I will continue where uh, Dr. Aditya stopped because there are a lot of things to be done mm -hmm. after the confirmation of the diagnosis uh, because uh, uh, there is a lot of molecular markers are coming out. And uh, so while doing marrow in an AML case or uh, APML, AML, uh, for APML, uh, we will. Uh, I will start with APML because the confirmation itself need a uh, study of uh, either uh, uh, we have to find out whether the PML RAR is there, transcript is there. So that is a confirmatory thing for in APML. And then coming to the non-APML AMLs, uh, there are a lot of uh, molecular markers. So we have to do the cytogenetics. Then uh, the uh, the molecular uh, like uh, uh, these all these FL mutation status. The molecular uh, markers as well as the, uh, uh, to prognosticate and as well as to uh, do uh, whether to add any IDH mutants uh, and all the newer drugs. So so we have to prognosticate as well as to decide the best treatment. So we have to do the molecular studies, the fish studies, the cytogenetics in AML. And uh, again, in the case of ALL, again, we have to do the, uh, we will do the cytogenetics to know the hyperplody, hyperplody status and as well as the molecular markers like uh, the high risk and uh, poor risk factors, whether it is present or not. Uh, and uh, these are all the uh, additional tests in the marrow I will plan, uh, other than doing the confirmation with the uh, phenotype as well as the flow cytometry. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Nikrishan. So uh, to summarize that, 
once we have made the diagnosis of AML or ALL, our work workup doesn't stop there. We need to understand the disease in more depth. Look at the certain genetic abnormalities and mutations as well. And by looking, doing special tests, usually we cover three areas. First is we can do better subclassification of that particular disease. We can find targets by checking mutation. And third is we know more prognostic factors by doing further prognostic tests. So, uh, Dr. Unni Krishnan, can you give uh, just us a brief overview of ALL classification? ALL actually, uh, ALL is broad, can be broadly classified into the, the now the recent WHO classification came in 2022 for the um, hematological neoplasms and broadly they are coming under the uh, that uh, the premature that is the uh, uh, immature uh, uh, cell neoplasms, uh, lymphoid neoplasms, and uh, they are broadly categorized into B and uh, T. Again, uh, that, that is a uh, main classification, and uh, B again, ETPL is the uh, under the BL, and the BLL again uh, are divided into uh, these uh, 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 depending upon the uh, the good risk and uh, uh, poor risk category, depending upon the uh, the cytogenetics and the molecular markers. That is a ALL classification, uh, basically B and TAL. And BLL again uh, divided into uh, ETP and as well as the, uh, I don't know, uh, that uh, uh, as well as the BAL proper. And further risk stratification is there, good risk and poor risk is there. Uh, that is the ALL classification. Yes. So as our molecular understanding of this leukemias are expanding, these classifications are becoming bigger and bigger with lots of new entities and, you know, better information. So, Dr. Aditya, uh, can you give us a brief on AML classification? Is Dr. Aditya there? Uh, sir, I think Dr. Aditya left out due to some uh, technical glitch. Okay, okay. I'll just... Uh, so, Dr. Sunish or Dr. Unikishan would like to take this question, how AML is classified? Uh, AML uh, is uh, classified into uh, actually the recent classification is there. Uh, it is again actually WHO classification. Actually, it is made simple as compared to the previous one. I think it is L with the uh, with the uh, with the, uh, some uh, not recurrent genetic abnormality. They use some other term like uh, like uh, I, I uh, like uh, they are the. Uh, the, 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 anyway, it is a uh, uh, genetic with uh, defining genetic events. Uh, that is AML with the defining genetic yes. events is there, and then again, yes. uh, or then AML with the uh, with uh, with the uh, uh, that is a one category, and second category is AML with uh, with a different class of maturation is there without differentiation, without uh, with minimal differentiation, without maturation, with maturation. Then uh, and then basophilic, monomyelomonocytic, monocytic, erythro, and and then again megakaryocytic leukemia like that. The genetic abnormality is a big classification, and even the uh, MDS related is coming under that actually. So there is a broad two categories. Yes. So we have seen six related AML and therapy. Yeah. Arising from the prior MDS. Right. So yeah. recently we have seen uh, you know lots of changes in classification even then it is now more relying on genetic information rather than morphology and uh, clinical features uh, so as we know that there are no stages in leukemia you cannot stage leukemia for so for leukemia we have something called risk stratification so dr sunish what is risk stratification for acute leukemia and how does it help in making treatment decisions uh, <clears throat> actually uh... As you said, it is a wonderful point that there is no stage in leukemia. Actually, uh, so the patients will be very uh, eager to know what is the exact stage. So only we can say is what is the risk of the disease. Uh, it uh, depends on uh, what kind of disease uh, is patient is having. Whether it can, it could be a, it can be a, a, a lymphoblastic leukemia or a myeloblastic leukemia. So the risk stratifications are different for all these things. Uh, first, we can see the acute myeloid leukemia, uh, myeloid, myeloid leukemia. First of all, we uh, classify for the therapy purpose, we classify 
APML, M3AML versus non-M3AML. This, this is the first step. So for the, uh, the stratification also is different for this, these two things. For an M3AML, um, previously there were there were uh, three uh, three risk, risk group, low, intermediate, and high. But uh, now um, it has uh, combined to only uh, two two risks, low and high risk. Uh, that is purely based on the uh, WBC count. If the count is less than ten thousand, uh, it is a low risk, and if it is more than ten thousand, WBC count is more than ten thousand, it is high risk APML. Previously, we used to add uh, this uh, 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 player count also. If it is less than 40,000, uh, it, co it comes to the uh, intermediate risk. So uh, how this will help uh, in uh, treating the APML is like, um, uh, if it is a low risk uh, APML, uh, we can uh, easily, uh, most of the time, we can easily avoid uh, chemotherapy. Uh, uh, like uh, uh, anthracycline can be avoided and you can give uh, this uh, arsenic adra only for induction and uh, after that consultation. Uh, but in high risk AMLs, uh, APMLs, you usually uh, add on uh, with uh, um, uh, some kind of um, uh, cytoreduction, uh, most probably under segments. And in high risk APMLs, uh, there should be, uh, we should anticipate the differential syndrome and you should give uh, prophylactic steroids also. But in low risk, uh, you, uh, once you develop a differentiated syndrome, uh, it is given. So this is uh, one uh, risk stratification for APML. And then uh, comes to the when it comes to the AML, uh, also the treatment is entirely dependent on the uh, risk, like uh, poor risk, uh, uh, intermediate, and uh, good risk. That is based mainly on the <clears throat> cytogenetics. So if the cytogenetic analysis is showing uh, translocation 821 or inversion 16 or um, biallelic SEPA or um, this thing NBM with the uh, FLT3 mutated, it comes to a, a good risk. Uh, and uh, the, the treatment for a good risk is uh, induction, three, uh, three induction followed by uh, consult, uh, hydrocytrabin consultation. Those patients, uh, uh, if the uh, post-induction MRD is negative, you can just give hydrocytrabin and uh, just follow the patient and uh, you can avoid transplant uh, in the, those patients. But uh, when it comes to the intermediate and high risk patients, uh, like uh, in the, uh, intermediate, uh, I, uh, uh, there are multiple uh, other translocations, uh, including uh, 9, um, 8, 14, all, all this comes to intermediate. And uh, if there is multiple uh, karyotyping abnormalities, hyperproidy, all this comes to poor risk. So those kind of patients will need uh, 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 transplant, uh, allow, allow transplant. Uh, so, so this is the important of risk stratification in uh, AML uh, and uh, uh, they, this again comes to uh, play in uh, deciding the treatment for a a ALL also. ALL mainly the risk certification depends mainly on the um, the regimen you are using because uh, the standard thing was NCA risk uh, classification that was previously used so that mainly includes the age and uh, uh, total WC count. But uh, once you uh, start on uh, the the risk certification is slightly different in the DFM. Uh, protocol. So that includes uh, the type of uh, the cell including whether it is B or T, whether pH is positive or negative, or uh, the age classification is slightly different for that and the uh, counts uh, are also included in uh, the making the patient low uh, and high risk. So what is the difference in this uh, risk certification is for a low risk patient, you can give some uh, low uh, low intensive chemotherapy so that the side effects and the long term problems of your chemotherapy can be avoided and uh, you are uh, selecting the high risk patients so, uh, so that you can intensively treat those patients with the high um, uh, high risk uh, chemotherapy high intense chemotherapy so that there can be uh, there is a high chance of cure uh, for uh, those kind of patients so uh, these are the general uh, uh, stratification of risk and uh, the main uh, difference in treatment uh, that's
Great. Thank you, Dr. Sunish. So uh, when we look at the leukemia treatment protocols, they look very lengthy and complicated and we see different phases. So Dr. Aditya, can we can you explain the different phases of treatment in leukemia and concept behind that? I think um, uh, th this is another question which we have to deal with uh, in our clinics every day when, when, we, when patients talk to us. So let's do ALL first and then do AML. With yes. ALL, the idea is to try and bring the patient into remission as quickly as possible. So that is where we follow the first phase of treatment is called as induction phase of treatment. So induction phase of treatment is designed at trying to get a patient of ALL into remission. This usually includes a prolonged period, four to five weeks of uh, high dose steroids along with multiple IV chemotherapy medications followed by another three or four blocks of IV chemotherapy, both of which put together form the induction phase of treatment. Subsequently, when we know that the patient has attained remission, the patient has become MRD or minimal residual disease negative, the next phase of therapy is directed towards trying to reduce the risk of central nervous system or sanctuary site disease uh, uh, relapse. So that is where we try and do something called as a high dose methotrexate or a high dose chemotherapy based regimen, wherein you know, for two months, we give a higher than normal dose of chemotherapy, especially methotrexate, and then uh, wait for the medicines to clear from the body. That way we are able to attack even these sanctuary sites, the so-called blood brain barrier or the blood testis barrier, to make sure disease does not come back in those sanctuary sites. Once we have done the consolidation phase of treatment, the next part of the treatment depends entirely on whether which what is the risk stratification of the patient. If a patient is uh, Philadelphia positive, pH positive, or tra chrome 920 translocation positive, this is a good time for us to take a patient to a bone marrow transplant, especially if there's a matched sibling donor and allogenic bone marrow transplant is recommended at this point of time. However, if it's a low risk patient, if the MRD is negative, it's a BALL, then this is when we would want to do something like a reinduction phase, wherein whatever medications were given in the first couple of months, we sort of repeat them just to do as a reintensification phase of treatment. So this six month period makes up the intensive phase of therapy. The exact uh, medicines might vary based on whether we use the UK protocol or the BFM protocol. I personally use the BFM protocol, but essentially the backbone of the treatment is the same. Once the intensive phase of treatment is over, then we have two years of oral tablet-based treatment, which is also very, very significant in, the pre in, the, in preventing a relapse of ALL. So in ALL, the total duration of therapy is for about two and a half to three years of which the first six months is going to be an intensive phase and the next two years is going to be a maintenance phase of treatment. Moving on to AMLs, here the things change up a little bit more. The risk stratification plays a very big role right at the start. So all patients with AML, we first need to decide whether it's a curative intent of treatment or a non-curative intent of treatment. If it's a curative intent of treatment, then the first thing that we do is we do something called as an induction or a 7 plus 3 chemotherapy. Subsequent to the induction chemotherapy, we would want to know whether the patient has got a high risk genetic mutation or a st standard risk or a low good risk mutation. Based on the mutation profile and the cytogenetic profile, we decide whether the patient needs consolidation chemotherapy or a consolidation bone marrow transplant. So again, in AML, the principle is to bring the patient from a leukemic stage into a remission stage. But to prevent the leukemia from coming back, to prevent the relapse, uh, the, the two options that we have are either a chemotherapy or a high-dose chemotherapy-based consolidation, which is given for three cycles in a patient with good risk uh, AML. However, if a patient has got intermediate poor risk AML, then it's a no-brainer to try and give maybe one more cycle of uh, chemotherapy and take the patient up to transplant. Finally, when we come to patients who are not having a curative intent of treatment, as in patients who are elderly AMLs, in them, chemotherapy more or less is not an option. Here is where there are so many rapid advances which have happened and multiple target therapies are available. 
So there is no actual phase of therapy over here. Everybody is put on the targeted therapies based upon their own molecular profiles. Thank you, Dr. Aditya. Very clear and simple explanation of all the phases of leukemia treatment. So in recent years, uh, you know, there is a, a very important concept has emerged out in response assessment of leukemia, which is called minimal residual disease or measurable residual disease. So Dr. Onikrishnan, what is MRD and what is its role in the management of leukemia in present time? So uh, 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 until recently, the or uh, last five to 10 years, the uh, remission status as Ralti already told that uh, the uh, how we are uh, assessing the response to treatment in leukemia, we are uh, the previously you we were just doing the bone marrow and to look the percentage of the uh, blast in the marrow. That was the previous uh, evaluation method. But they found that that is it is not a sensitive method. And so, so uh, while uh, looking for a more sensitive methods, which can have a, 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 a more precise uh, and uh, precise uh, estimation of the blast cells and as well as the, uh, which can predict the a marker, which can predict the response to a, a more precise response to therapy as well as the chances of relapse. So the MR, the concept of MRD came. So this is known as a minimal residual disease. So without, uh, it is a final method to detect some, uh, uh, some markers in the, or some uh, markers of the disease present in the, remaining in the marrow. So the different methods are there to find out the minimal residual disease in the bone marrow. And uh, so that is the importance of a minimal residual disease. So it is basically to detect the residual disease, whichever is remaining in the marrow and is not detectable by the conventional morphological methods. And the importance of that, it is uh, we can uh, have a prognostication based on that because if MRD is positive, so minimal residual disease is still remaining in the marrow, uh, there is a high chance for relapse. So uh, depending upon the prognosis, we can decide the intensification on the intensification of other treatment. So the, some uh, in ALL and AML treatment, the MRML in ALL, if the MRD is becoming positive after induction and all, we have to uh, we have to intensify the treatment and we have to think about the uh, transplantation. And so the so MRD is we are doing at certain points in ALL. As you all discussed, we will do at the end of induction, then end of the consolidation we will do. So uh, to know whether we have to intensify the treatment and we have to do a transplant and all. So that is, and there are different, different methods to find out the MRD uh, depending upon, and the sensitivity varies between that. Uh, usually the flow cytometry is there, then a PCR uh, polymerase chain reaction is there. And uh, later, latest uh, NGS, new generation sequence <coughs> is there. And so there are different methods are used and the purpose of uh, doing MRD is this to prognosticate and to decide upon the intensification of treatment and need for transplantation. That's it. Thank you, Dr. Omnikrishnan. So a very, uh, it's an excellent explanation. So in short, uh, MRD is to quantify the residual disease of the treatment as accurate as possible. And if we put some cutoffs in defining MRD, it, it, it becomes the, one of the strongest prognostic factor, particularly for acute lymphoblastic leukemias. So, uh, you know, with improvement in supportive care, mortality um, in patients with leukemia during uh, intense treatment is reducing day by day. But still, the highest risk of death in patients undergoing treatment with leukemia is usually in the first month when there is, when disease is also active and you are treating patients with very high dose chemotherapies. So, and one of the most important complications is tumor lysis syndrome. So, Dr. Uh, Sunish, what is tumor lysis syndrome and how it is managed? Uh, tumor lysis uh, syndrome, it is a, um, uh, after uh, name indicates, it's because of the rapid kill of uh, leukemic uh, cells uh, because of the your chemotherapy or, or, or it may be, okay, it may occur spontaneously because of the rapid turnover of the cells. Like if the tumor is very, uh, having a very uh, high degree of proliferation, like uh, uh, Burkitt uh, uh, lymphoma, uh, there will be uh, a significant number of uh, cells are will be uh, killed every second. So that will pour all the cellular content into the system circulation. 
so uh, what will be there uh, in the uh, cell will be uh, mostly this is rich in potassium phosphorus and uh, the uh, nuclear debris including all the nucleic acids will be poured into the uh, systemic circulation and this will uh, load the kidney uh, and it will affect all other systemic uh, <clears throat> organs uh, so the the tumor lysis syndrome uh, actually uh, the classification is like uh, it is uh, classified as a laboratory TLS uh, or a clinical TLS. What is the uh, what is what is the, what it uh, means is that the component of the tumor lysis syndrome includes the biochemical abnormalities like there will be hyperkalemia because the 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 intracellular potassium will be uh, coming out. There will be hyperphosphatemia because the malignant cells are very rich in phosphate. So this hyperphosphatemia will in turn stimulate the parathyroid uh, gland and uh, there will be parathormone and that will, stimul uh, that will suppress the calcium levels and there will be hypocalcemia. And uh, once all the nucleic acids are uh, uh, got into the circulation, it will be uh, finally uh, end into, uh, entered into the salvage pathway and uh, there will be rapid production of the uric acid. Which will be uh, uh, which, which will not be possible for the kidney to eliminate as it is uh, produced. So there will be hyperuricemia. So these are the components of a tumor lysis syndrome. So <clears throat> uh, in laboratory TLS, there will be twenty five percentage increase from the baseline value of all these uh, all these things like uh, uric acid more than eight. Eight will be uh, the cutoff. Then uh, potassium six. Uh, then uh, phosphate uh, 4.5 and um, uh, calcium will be uh, 7. If it is, there is 25% uh, change from the baseline value, you can uh, at least two of them be present and you can have a uh, laboratory TLS. But a clinical TLS, there will be renal failure, like 1.5 times elevation of the serum creatine. Sudden death can be there or uh, seizure, uh, all this comprise the uh, clinical TLS. So the time period will be um, in the, uh, actually the Cairo Bishop classification, the time period is given from three days prior to the chemotherapy and seven days after the chemotherapy. So these 10 days uh, uh, comprises the, uh, the period when there will be maximum uh, tumor lysis. This is because the, the in Burkitt lymphoma and leukemia, uh, there will be um, spontaneous tumor lysis. So there is a, uh, the, the, but uh, after uh, uh, after you start on chemotherapy also, there can be uh, tumor lysis. And the tumor lysis uh, can be seen in some uh, solid tumors uh, also. So, uh, uh, those are having high high uh, proliferative index, like uh, germ cell tumor also. But it is mostly seen in uh, pediatric uh, leukemias, pedi especially pediatric ALLs and uh, pediatric lymphomas. But it is uh, openly seen in adults also. So how will you approach this problem? First and foremost is prevention. Uh, we have to anticipate the problem and we have to prepare for that. Uh, so what, uh, what should be uh, done is adequately hydrate the patient. Uh, hydration is the uh, key thing because our kidney is far, far better than a um, dialysis machine. So the kidney can eliminate <clears throat> any amount of uh, waste uh, if there is adequate uh, vo volume. So uh, that uh, comes to around 3 liter per meter square of uh, IV fluids uh, over uh, 24 hours. But sometimes you need uh, more uh, aggressive hydration. Then uh, the problem of uh, re uh, the renal failure happens because the uric acid crystals, the calcium phosphate crystals can uh, occlude the tubules, renal tubules, and it will eventually produce tubular necrosis and uh, renal failure. So in order to prevent that, uh, uric acid excretion can be uh, decreased by the use of either uh, allopurinol or a febuxostat. Uh, those things can produce, uh, decrease the amount of uric acid produced and uh, the more soluble <clears throat> uh, uh, precursors of the uric acid can be uh, there and they can be easily eliminated. The previously, the hydration was along with alkalinization, but uh, now the thing is alkalinization is not that much indicated in uh, case of uh, uh, tumor lysis because alkalinization can produce 
precipitation of this uh, hyposandine and sandine that can again produce problems. Once there is tumor lysis set in, <clears throat> you need to uh, use uh, rasburic acid. Rasburic acid uh, will uh, uh, decrease the uh, uric acid levels after a single uh, injection. Otherwise, uh, if the renal failure has set in, you have to uh, do dialysis. So these are the management strategies uh, that we use. But before that, we have to stratify the patient, which patient who will go for a tumor lysis. That depends on the risk, uh, risk criteria. Uh, usually that depends on the type of the disease uh, because uh, pediatric ALLs and uh, lymphomas are more chance. And those who are having more than one lakh count and uh, those who are having high LDH, those uh, whose kidneys are already already at a risk, um, all are uh, at a risk. So these patients are having a high risk and uh, those without all these problems is having a low risk. And the low risk patients, you need intensive hydration, allopurinol, uh, all this can help. But in high risk patients, we give prophylactic rasburic acid uh, so that it will prevent the development of uh, renal failure and uh, these things. Thank you, Dr. Sunish, for explaining TLS in detail. Uh, so identifying high-risk patients and uh, early intervention is very important in the management of TLS. So Dr. Sunish, can you uh, highlight a few specific toxicities of uh, conventional chemotherapeutic regimens used in ALL and AML? Yeah. Uh, so uh, there are ALL, usually there are a lot of uh, regimes, other, but backbone, main drugs remain the same. Uh, so coming to uh, um, uh, if a BFM-like regime is using uh, the induction part, or the doctor already told, told there is an induction part consolidation and uh, then re-induction is there. So in induction, the main drugs are always an anthracycline, like a donorobicin. So uh, then some the donorobicin, they are uh, one main toxicity is myelosuppression itself. Patient may be going through the... Uh, so all these uh, chemotherapeutic agents, most of the drugs have... A, a severe myelosuppression, so the patient will be going through a myelosuppressive phase and the counts will be very low. So that is common to all. Then uh, the specific toxicity on the cycle is a cardiotoxicity. So before starting the drugs, usually we'll be having a cardiac evaluation and uh, to make sure that the cardiac functions are adequate uh, before starting the anthracyclines. And uh, that is the main toxicity coming to mind while uh, discussing about the anthracycline. So there is a uh, capping of the dose, uh, we will do after certain uh, doses of anthracycline will stop. We, uh, so we have to be cautious while uh, giving more and more anthracycline. That is not usually during the induction, but at some points, if the, uh, there is a recurrence and all that, we have to be cautious about giving the uh, whether we are reaching the capping dose like that. Then, then coming another drug is used in ALL is the vincristin like that in induction phase. So they are notorious for a neuropathy and all. Uh, neuropathy, uh, then even some intestinal issues uh, may be there, even uh, intestinal, uh, there may have prone for constipation and all, even bubble uh, motility may be affected. So that's the thing. And then uh, in the pediatric ALL and all, we may use the asparaginase. Uh, so that is there, it is notorious for producing a pancreatitis, then uh, vein thrombosis like that. Then glycemic control is important, LFT derangement can occur. So toxicity is the with the L aspirogenase. Then uh, steroids, that is a main treatment, a backbone of uh, uh, ALL treatment. It, uh, the, they are all, uh, it is a well-known side effects other, including signs of infection, hyperglycemia, then uh, then uh, gastric irritation, a lot of things are there. So we have to give adequate, uh, while using all these uh, chemotherapeutic agents and steroids, we have to give adequate infection prophylaxis and be careful about the uh, neutropenia as well as uh, uh, infectious complications to occur. Then coming to the consolidation of ALL, it uh, again uh, contains uh, uh, some re uh, some uh, they may be giving the say, phase B and all BFM. So citrabin uh, so may be there. Again, they are uh, uh, prone for this myelosuppression. Then citrabin, there is some side effects, especially for high dose citrabin, like cerebellar toxicities have been seen. Uh, then uh, there is one effect, then cutaneous toxicities have been seen. 
like that. Then coming to methotrexate, this is another important drug in treatment of ALL with high uh, CNS penetration. It is uh, known for uh, CNS toxicity, then mucositis. Then we have to be careful about the renal function and as well as the hydration and all. So there, it is notorious for a renal uh, failure, to produce renal failure. Then uh, hepat we have to be cautious about hepatic dysfunction and even the CNS toxicity can occur. And we have to give uh, frequent uh, intrathecal administration so the patient uh, may be getting in radical uh, so uh, spy, uh, some meningitis and all some worst scenario like that so that is the uh, then in uh, after the uh, giving the intensive phase uh, of iv chemotherapy will be having some primary radiation followed by some maintenance treatment for two years like that during that time uh, we are usually giving methotrexate in low dose and 6 mp 6 uh, mercaptopurine and all they are all uh, notorious for myelosuppression as well as liver abnormalities, hepatic toxicity, so in low doses. So you have to be cautious about that uh, in the thing. And uh, some maintenance phase, the patient may be approaching a general physician to the nearby hospital rather than going to the oncologist himself. So we have to look into the CBC as well as the LFT very well, whether any derangement is there. Coming to the AML, the same drugs are usually used, like high dose. Uh, we are in injection. We are using giving the anthracycline, the same toxicity like cardiac toxicity, then myelosuppression, and we are giving some cytorabin again, and also in the consolidation phase, RAC is considered. So cerebellar toxicity is notorious. Then uh, cutaneous toxicity can occur, and conjunctivitis, chemical conjunctivitis with high dose RAC can occur. These are the usual class side effects, other than myelosuppression, nausea, vomiting, to the uh, these specific agents. I think. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Nikeshan. You have covered very uh, specific and important points. Um, so this is for, this question is for Dr. Sunish that, uh, you know, for patients with ALL, uh, we know that 30 to 70 percent patient can fail conventional chemotherapy regimens. And we have seen lots of new molecule and treatment discoveries in last few years, which, which has very specific target and relies on, you know, immune uh, responses. So if your patient fails conventional chemotherapy regimen, uh, patients with acute lymphoblastic leukemia, what are the novel treatment options we have right now? Uh, in all the leukemias, actually, the pediatric ALL is the, uh, the thing that gives happiness to the treating uh, physician so that uh, we can uh, frequently see the cure. But uh, uh, in, uh, 30, uh, in adult uh, leukemia, uh, ALL, the, the thing is not that, that much bright because oh, around 40% of the patients will survive uh, five, uh, five, five years. Most of the patients will have a recurrence or relapse. And in uh, pediatric leukemia, around uh, 15 uh, to 20% will have a uh, relapse uh, repertory leukemia. So, <clears throat> so once they relapse, again, the patient uh, has to uh, go again with the chemotherapy and uh, transplant. Uh, but now there are so many other options that have come into picture and uh, the, uh, the the cytogenetics uh, plays a bigger role if uh, the there is a ph positive all the uh, the thing is we uh, the the treatment starts with the, uh, <clears throat> tks uh, along with the chemotherapy so that will increase the cure rate uh, but in all other cases, uh, there are uh, other drugs like uh, uh, bite uh, molecules like uh, um, T-cell uh, engagers, like a blinatumumab and uh, then um, chemo plus uh, toxic conjugate like uh, um, ionotusumab, uh, osagomycin. And in, in the case of T cell ALL uh, preferential uh, uh, only nelarabin, uh, then uh, uh, all these are newer molecules that can that that are being used uh, very now, nowadays frequently, uh, not much that frequently, but uh, usually one or two times. Uh, the thing that is upcoming in the treatment of uh, ALL and lymphoma is the CAR T therapy. Uh, it is a <clears throat> adoptive cell th therapy. Uh, that is, uh, the patient uh, T cells are taken 
and they are genetically uh, engineered to uh, change their immune activity against the um, patients on leukemic cells and again infused back to the patient so that an immune response is created against the leukemia in that patient particularly so that needs a um, time a time delay for creating the gar t and uh, um, uh, special techniques to produce the gar t but now uh, our uh, tmh all are coming with a generic gar t um, option uh, but uh, they are all in <clears throat> uh, all in her uh, very childhood stage uh, but th there may be a pro promising future for all the relapsed uh, refractory ALN. But now uh, nothing is uh, that much promising, even if uh, you can, uh, there are some uh, ready to use molecules like this blinatumab and all. All are having a, uh, some benefit for uh, patients, but uh, with the, uh, all the toxicities like uh, CRS and ICANS and uh, risk of infections, all these are there when we come to a last refractory setting for an AML. So these are the common um, things um, that comes to our mind when we think of uh, newer agents. Thank you, Dr. Sunish. So immune-based uh, molecules and CAR-T remains uh, you know, the only option when patient fails chemotherapeutic agents. And it is really promising, even though we are facing financial challenges, all these treatment options are available in India also now. Uh, so for AML, uh, everybody knows seventh induction, which is there for almost 50 years. We didn't have anything for you know four to five decades. But for last five years, five to seven years, maybe we are seeing new drug approvals in AML as well. So uh, Dr. Aditya, would you like to highlight novel treatment options for AML? Uh, excellent, uh, Dr. Abhishek. So the first thing is that in a curative intent AML, whenever we pick up a FLT3 mutation, we have an approved targeted uh, therapy called midostaurin, which is used both as a part of the induction and subsequent to the induction treatment protocol. So uh, in a curative intent patient, although there will be multiple uh, molecular targets available, FLT3 or a FLT3 mutation is... Uh, plays a role in deciding our first-line treatment option. <clears throat> when we talk about elderly AMLs or non-curative intent AMLs, here there are so many target options available. I think the combination of aza cytidine with venetoclax, venetoclax is a BCA2 inhibitor, the combination of aza and venetoclax has become a standard of care for most of us who are able to access the medicine. The, the small irony here is that it is not available in India and we either have to import it or use a uh, uh, contraband version of it. But uh, other side of the is a very friendly, it is it, 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 it produces good response rate. So the earliest targeted therapy for AML was a demethylating agent called azacetine or desetabine. But today, I think the standard of care would be a combination of azacetine with venetoclax. Also, in most patients with uh, AML, we would search for other mutations, especially if we are able to run the NGS plan in the last six, eight months. I've picked up multiple patients, even with the IDH mutations, and we have multiple drugs like IOC done, which has already been uh, approved for use and again available either on a compassionate basis program or on an import license based uh, way to use. Another big uh, targeted therapy in AML is called as jiltertinib. This is again a medication which is used for patients with FLT3 mutation. And um, I, I've had the chance of using this medicine as well. And again, these, these medications are fairly well tolerated, not very toxic, and do provide some amount of lasting response in, in such a difficult to treat malignancy. Uh, the the other uh, drug which is now available is a combination of liposomal 7 plus 3 combination, which, which is again approved for use in the West in uh, in, in a non-curative uh, in, uh, intent. So it's called CPX351, I think. So, so that's what is available in the West. I have not had too much of experience of using that in India. So in terms of the recent advances for treating AML, 
the targeted mutations, driver mutations are a very big class of drugs. The demethylidines are uh, again a very big class of drugs and uh, minotoclax has made its presence felt here. Um, I, 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 I I don't, I mean, there are so many new drugs available and all of them are undergoing multiple phase one, phase two trials, but these are in essence the, the approved uh, medications available. Thank you, Dr. Aditya. So I think AML remains the most challenging cancer, but uh, with the availability of all these new drugs and new trials ongoing, I think future looks good. And maybe in 10, 15 years, we might be treating AML with tablets also. Uh, so we know that BMT or hematopoietic stem cell transplant can cure leukemia. So, Dr. Aditya, can you tell us indications of BMT in a case of acute leukemia? So, uh, let us start with ALL. The, the indications for BMT in a patient with ALL are based upon the genetic uh, predisposition which the patient has. If a patient has translocation 922 or a Philadelphia chromosome, that becomes a straightforward indication for a bone marrow transplant. Again, MLL gene uh, translocations, again, make it a straightforward indication for a bone marrow transplant. Uh, any relapsed case of ALL is a straightforward indication for a bone marrow transplant. Again, uh, if in morphological remission, uh, we had a big discussion about measurable residual disease or a MRD. So if a patient is MRD positive, even at the end of consolidation phase, that's again a very big uh, indication for us to try and go into a transplant. So, so ALL be again divided as a first remission, CR1 transplant indications and CR2. Anybody who's had a relapse and reached CR2 is directly due for transplant. Moving on to AMLs, um, there is a very uh, precise risk stratification and an indication for transplant. And these patients are classified as good risk, intermediate risk or poor risk based on their uh, cytogenetic characteristics and based on their molecular characteristics. So any patient with, let's say, a complex karyotype or more than three abnormal, uh, uh, so more than three chromosome abnormalities, that's a straightforward indication for a bone marrow transplant. Any patient with a 5Q monosomy 7, all of these are indications for a transplant. Any patient with a FLT3 mutation, especially a FLT3 ITD or the internal tandem duplication type of a FLT3 mutation, Again, these are all uh, patients for a straightforward bone marrow transplant. Again, any patient with AML, irrespective of how the cytogenetics is, if they have relapsed and if we are able to get them into a second remission, CR2, all AML CR2s are a straightforward indication for a bone marrow transplant. The role of MRD testing in AML is uh, more and more coming into work. The, the issue with MRD in AML is that it's not yet very well standardized for us. However, a case can be made that if MRD is positive in AML, then there is a value added in doing a transplant for them as well. Thank you, Dr. Aditya. So, uh, uh, yes, so transplant can cure leukemia and even though there are no surgeries or any you know, high-risk procedures, but this process itself is a very uh, immunologically complicated procedure and it can lead to lots of complications. So, Dr. Unikrishan, what are the outcomes and challenges in transplanting leukemia patients? Yeah, uh, the, uh, the transplant, uh, I will start with the uh, transplant procedure then, because uh, in uh, acute leukemia, other than APML, we are planning for an, uh, had, uh, we are uh, uh, planning for an allogenic transplant. So allogenic transplant means we have to get the donor, we have to get the stem cells from uh, another person. So uh, in worldwide, the cha main challenge to get an allergenic transplant to be done is the donor. So the patient, uh, the most uh, uh, easy one is to get a sibling, mass sibling donor transplant. That is the uh, that is the most uh, most easy way to get an allergenic transplant. But unfortunately, most of the patients will not be have a such a mass sibling. Uh, so uh, that, that is the main challenge. So in that case, we will be opting for an haploid transplant as well as a mud mass unrelated donor transplant. So both these are associated with a higher chance of uh, uh, a lot of complications like uh, uh, like GBSD is there. And uh, uh, so we need a lot of uh, myelo immunosuppression lot of, and th that is the uh, first thing. So get a suitable donor. That is the first challenge to get a transplant. And uh, in coming to Indian scenario, another difficulty is uh, the, the logistics. 
that is another important thing because uh, the patients are uh, need a huge amount of money to be mobilized for the transplant to be done while coming to a mass sibling or transplant that is the most cost effective one uh, because uh, we can uh, have a uh, lesser number of uh, complications so uh, if it is even it is not affordable even that it is not affordable in most of the patients in india so cost is the main important thing and then the mud transplant and haploid transplant they are also associated with a higher chance of uh, complications and so higher cost and mud uh, for mass donor donor transplant we have a lot of registries and all but getting the stem cell to our hand it take a lot of cost so and again lot of complications so uh, in india we tell uh, other than the uh, 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 getting the donor logistics is the main uh, thing to do uh, the hindrance and the third thing is the uh, when governments consider the governments and there is a lot of patients are there so the very long waiting list is there so uh, the centers where uh, common people can approach is comparatively less so Uh, these are the things i will the challenges uh, for the patients to get the transplant and that is i think so and uh, so that is the practical challenges in getting a transplant bit done and uh, uh, so uh, whether sir whether to explain the uh, the specific complications of transplant or just the challenges uh, uh, whether to explain that also yeah i think challenges are fine complication will be i think to uh, to lend the yeah 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 sure okay thank you dr nikeshan so i think we have reached our last question so despite of lots of advancement we have seen in uh, discussing last one hour uh, when actual patient of leukemia come to our clinic the challenges are different starting from uh, delaying diagnosis financial constraints patient compliance and drug qualities there are lots of issues we face in our routine clinical practice so this question is for everyone we can start with dr sunish what are, what are the challenges you face in your clinical practice while treating a case of leukemia very very important question actually uh, even if we talk uh, so much uh, sophisticated thing things in leukemia the problems that we can apply the the reality in reality the the amount of science we can apply in our daily practice is there because actually i am working in a uh, mission hospital so uh, uh, so i see so many patients who are uh, uh, having difficulty to undergo all the treatment that we prescribe so the majority of the patients that comes to me having financial problems and uh, most of our uh, patients doesn't have any any uh, support systems like any proper insurance or any government system so once they have diagnosed their leukemia uh most of our patients will go to any government set- setups like uh, regional cancer centers or uh, <clears throat> those who can go and uh, stay there for some way for the treatment they will go otherwise they have to uh, <clears throat> approach some local hospitals um uh, uh, th- this is the major thing that i face is the financial problem the other things are uh, most of the most of the time even if Uh, uh the diagnostic difficulties uh, will be there uh, in some some rare cases that uh, th- those those things in nowadays we can easily tackle with the, um, our uh, connections networking and the use of um, uh, outsourcing in uh, some specified labs all this can be uh, made uh, and we can do it, do it easily then comes the once you started on treatment uh, then the the problem if the patient is the breadwinner of the family they has to be dependent to the hospital for around 4 to 6 months and they they, they cannot go to uh, their job and they are more concerned about their losing their jobs and uh, uh, because uh a middle class family may not have that much of uh, bank balance uh, to uh, survive all these catastrophes in most of most of the settings but some are very in good situation but most of are having some uh, these kind of problems then comes to the uh, the supportive uh, care that we have to provide uh, the proper uh, blood banking system and then uh, the antibiotics 
infective prophylaxis all, all these things uh, these are the um, uh, major challenges uh, that i see uh, when we are uh, treating the uh, once you got into the uh, got into the treatment these are the major problems that we face uh, in between but the before uh, starting how will you uh, how will how will you see after 6 months that is the first question that the patient has to answer how how you can survive this 6 months with this much of uh, financial toxicity that that has to be answered first then only we jump into the uh, treatment that's what i i feel yes dr sunil we understand your difficulties and pain <laughs> so dr unikishan and dr aditya if you want to comment or add any points please i think uh, uh, uh yeah go ahead go ahead okay okay so uh, the financial toxicity is the overriding concern for every one of us which was very well brought out so leukemia as a disease is not just you know it doesn't affect one person it affects the whole family in so many ways there is a social aspect to it there is a financial aspect to it take the case of children children are going growing they are going through school uh, young adults they are going through colleges so which means that they end up missing schools they end up missing their class year especially if somebody is in a college they end up missing a whole term or a whole year during treatment uh and most of the times if patients are in tier 3 tier 4 cities they need to come to tier 1 city wherein you know their uh, social backing is not there they need to find uh, um a place to stay for such a long time they need to find uh, things like how to keep the other children engaged how to keep the family engaged so there are so many aspects with in fact you know saint jude's actually runs uh, complete schools for their patients with um, ALL who are on treatment so um, the, the the i think the time is right to look at leukemia management in a more holistic manner we have concentrated so far of primarily on getting the medical advances to the patients that still has to be the number one focus and at the same time there has to be some kind of a support program at all levels for all sorts of uh, uh, patients not just at the government levels even at the corporate levels wherever it is to you know provide answers to the social issues as well thank you thank you dr aditya dr onikrish would you like yeah uh, yeah i uh, i think uh, more to i uh, must to add i, I will uh, the importance of infection because in leukemia patients are facing a lot of uh, resistant organisms while so i was in rcc in kerala regional cancer center the high volume center with a uh, uh, lot of leukemia but uh, at some time uh, we will uh, be very sad that even patient in remission going for a neutropenia and uh, getting a bad infection and none of the antibiotics are working so that uh, in leukemia patients that all these sort of infections are uh, Uh, are are very rampant and uh, we are we are running short of proper uh, regular antibiotics and uh, any uh, nothing will work at some point of time i'm fearing about that also other than uh, logistics is there but that uh, this is uh, also a concern i think especially in leukemia and the hematological malignancies the uh, infections which are very uh, bad to handle nowadays actually some uh, gram negative infections and all second thing is that uh, availability of uh, quality drugs like i think venetoclax like that even the rich patients it is a lot of way to get the imported they are even if there some uh, the delay in getting the uh, the the class drugs to india that is there even that is for even for rich people in their willing there is a lot of hurdles to get the uh, that recommended drugs uh, that is the uh that is for a very few patients but uh, some people are found suffering from that also they are uh, they are not getting the uh, original brand of antoclax and all even if they are willing to delay in getting and all at proper time that, that is the right that is the thing i just wanted to add main problem is logistics itself but these are the minor things which can be added to that i think yeah okay thank you dr nikrishan uh, i don't think uh, there is anything to add and our panelists have Yeah, give an excellent insight on all the important points and aspects so uh, dr shubhi can we conclude the panel discussion yes so we'll just proceed yeah. with the vote of thanks so my sincere thanks to dr abhishek for wonderfully 
moderating this session on panel discussion a panel discussion on recent updates for diagnosis treatment and management of leukemia and my sincere thanks to our panelists dr aditya murali dr unni krishnan and dr sunesh uh, for being the panelists for this session also i would like to thank apollo hospitals bangalore and hcg cancer center ahmedabad for co hosting this session with us and Mr. Myerscope and Becca for supporting us throughout this session. My sincere thanks to all the participants who have joined us today via virtual mode, and also watching us through the live, uh, live, live uh, Facebook, YouTube, and LinkedIn uh, posts. Thank you all for being here. Uh, the recording of this session would be available on our platform, MedicalLearningHub.com. Uh, within two to three working days, and the certificate to all the live attendees would be given uh, to uh, to the live participants who are here with us on their registered email address. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Dr. Abhishek. Thank you, Dr. Sunish, Dr. Aditya, and Dr. Omnipresh for being with us. Today. Thank you, everyone. Great. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll request the audience who have not submitted the poll questions to kindly submit it. Thank you all for being with us today. I hope you had a great learning experience via MedicalLearningHub.com. I also request to audience to kindly subscribe us on all the social media platforms we are available and kindly be updated.